Good morning, Mr. Chairman, commissioners, staff, and guests. Um, <clears throat> today's spotlight, uh, I think you'll find incredibly interesting and informative. Um, it is 75 years of law enforcement off the pavement. It'll be presented by District 6 Captain Jeremy Harrell. Captain Harrell has been employed with the Wildlife Commission since 2003. Prior to that, he graduated from NC State University um, in wildlife biology, and he began his law enforcement career with North Carolina State Parks, where he was employed as a park ranger for seven and a half years. Um, currently, he is the D6 captain, and he lives in Cleveland County. And I'll say this, I, the Wildlife Commission doesn't have a, an official historian, but if we did, it would be Captain Jeremy Harrell, for sure. I think the Wildlife in North Carolina <laughs> magazine started in 1937, and I think Jeremy Harrell has read every one of them and has most of the pictures cataloged out of those magazines. So please welcome Captain Harrell. Well, appreciate that. Hey, I just can't begin to tell you this morning how excited I am and really how honored and humbled I am um, to be able to speak to you on behalf of the 200 plus wildlife officers in the state today and for all the <coughs> officers that have worn this uniform over the past uh, 75 years. So I've, I've, I've paid attention to the last few commission meetings and I've, I've seen a couple presentations that you have uh, from our law folks, um, Brady Beck and uh, Chris Jordan, I believe, and then Brad Howard, I think last month, uh, of some success stories of the Wildlife Commission. And if you didn't know before then, you know now, we have a very rich history here. And those guys set the bar really high, so I'm gonna do my best today. Um, so I wanna talk to you a little bit today about the law enforcement role and those success stories that these guys have told you a little bit about. In order to tell you the story, I've actually gotta take you back to the late 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, it was a, a terrible low spot for conservation, as many of you know. Uh, and across the country, not just North Carolina, but across the country. Um, conservation had taken a back seat to the mighty dollar for some time. Populations of wildlife had dwindled. Some were even non-existent by this point. Um, but then fortunately for us, there were some, some champions of conservation that kind of rose up. You know many of the names, Teddy Roosevelt, John Muir, some of those. But North Carolina had her very own um, champion of conservation as well. And his name was T. Gilbert Pearson. And some of you may not know him, but he was a passionate birder. Um, he, it was said that he would uh, travel around preaching conservation with an evangelistic zeal. I love uh, hearing that. And he, he knew that there was a big problem here and he wanted to solve it. He wanted to come up with a solution. And uh, he had this really crazy idea um, that he wanted to, uh, through the Audubon Society of North Carolina, create this statewide game law. The big problem he was having was the fact that there was probably going to be no funding from the state for it. And he actually said this. He said, we must labor joyously and without stint to form a line of defense as best we may between the wild creatures and the greed of thoughtless the, the interesting thing that, that he did, he knew that funding was going to be tough. So his big idea was, we're going to sell a non-resident hunting license to people who come to North Carolina hunt. That is 1903, and it was 15 bucks. And there were a lot of folks coming to North Carolina to hunt. And that's how we're going to fund this program. Well, he convinced the legislature to pass the Audubon Act in 1903, and we have hired our very first game wardens in North Carolina. Then they were actually called bird and game wardens. Well, unfortunately, uh, the the Audubon kind of lost its moment, momentum by 1909. <laughs> the county started seeing the money that was coming in from these hunting license sales, and they wanted it. And uh, so in 1909, really, it was the beginning of the end for the Audubon Society because 52 counties opted out of the Audubon law and things started to deteriorate. Essentially, what happened was that counties started legislating wildlife locally. And that really caused a big problem. Um, just to give you an example, at the, around that time, there were 40 different seasons for quail in the state. There were almost as many seasons for deer in the state. And so you can see, see the problem there. There was lots of decisions and laws made based on nothing, no science at all. It was just all about uh, getting the money. Well, the chief game warden of the United States of America came to Greensboro in 1923. The Audubon law was still in effect, but really had no power. And he said this, he said, unless there is some effort made to protect game, the people of the state will see it vanish. And that was 1923. And there were, there were some, some legislation that was tr tried to be passed for several years. Finally, in 1927, we did pass a state game law. And I'll go back up just a little bit about the Audubon Society. 
that they that made us in 1903 the very first state in the South to have a law. So obviously things went bad. 1927, the Department of Conservation and De Development took over the role of wildlife conservation in the state. And in 1927, they were called game wardens. That's what their badge looked like. 1933, <clears throat> there were a few changes in, in the law and they started referring to game wardens as game protectors. Then we changed houses again in 1935 under the Division of Game and Inland Fisheries. So before that, game was in one part and fish was in another. Finally, they consolidated and in 1935, under Division of Game, Linden Fisheries, they became, we became known as protectors. Well, finally, in 1947, with the creation of the Wildlife Resources Commission, uh, then and henceforth, still in the law today, uh, wildlife officers, game wardens, whatever you want to call us, uh, have been officially known as wildlife protectors in North Carolina. <clears throat> um, the very first, um, uh, I guess, appointed Director lasted a few months, and then in 1948, uh, Clyde Patton, I don't know if any of you have ever read about him or heard about him, but he was appointed executive director, and he actually served as the executive director for nearly 30 years. So, Cam, you got a, you got a little ways to go to catch up. <laughs> um, the big thing that Patton done, he was a passionate uh, conservation guy, and uh, he, he liked to think outside the box, and, and um he really rallied the citizens of the state and the, and the staff around this motto that become the motto of the Wildlife Commission. It was more sport for more people, equal opportunity for all. That was the motto for the Wildlife Commission his entire tenure as the director and for many years after that, as a matter of fact. In 1947, we hired 104 wildlife protectors. By 1948, uh, every county in the state had at least one wildlife protector. And as far as I know, this is one of the first first pictures ever taken of the district captains or district supervisors as they called them back then for the nine districts that the, the law in 1947 had created. Now this is a really interesting uh, thing that I felt like we really needed to talk about because in 1927 when that state game law that took over from the, the Audubon law, uh, we established, the law established a refuge system that continued to uh, even after the the uh, creation of the Wildlife Commission and the, the people who worked on those refuges were not called wildlife protectors, they were called refuge protectors. And uh, they, they had an interesting job because 50% of their job was game management and 50% of their job was law enforcement. And I, I picked a few of these pictures out. And again, we, we went to the refuge system and then we eventually went to wildlife management areas. And in 1971, we moved over to the game land system. At that time, the refuge protectors that were working, there were 22, they switched over to the Division of Protection, and we no longer had refuge protectors anymore. I put a few of these pictures on here uh, intentionally. Faith Rivenbark, guy on the left, he was the refuge protector at Holly Shelter in 1942. His grandson, Jay Rivenbark, if any of y'all know him, he's a retired captain uh, here. And so uh, he, he, here he is standing in 1942. He'd seized some, some shotguns from a legal turkey hunter. Um, <coughs> I was talking to Mr. Atkinson um, a little earlier and um, he, he knows the guy on, or knew the guy on the right here. That's Ollie Thompson. This is kind of back home for me. This is uh, two of the refuge protectors at the URI refuge uh, on an illegal fur uh, trapping case uh, in 1949. Well, somebody in the commission had the foresight in 1948 to say, hey, you know, I think an aircraft would be an effective law enforcement tool. This is 1948. And um, the Wildlife Commission, I can imagine them sitting at some kind of table like you are today, and they voted to rent a plane. And they had two pilots uh, that worked for us already. They were uh, World War II fighter pilots, uh, Jack Campbell out of Sanford, North Carolina, and Hugh V. Hines out of Wilmington. They, they made them pilots. They took this rented plane around the state and made 10 stops on a PR tour to try to convince the citizens, the sportsmen, and uh, the wildlife protectors that a plane would be useful. So in November of 48, the commission bought its very first plane for Piper Cub. Uh, it was funny too, it's kind of interesting that uh, I titled this one first in flight because I, I recently found out that the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission was the very first agency to have a plane in North Carolina. <clears throat> We've had planes ever since. We've had as many as five at one time in the 60s and 70s. Uh, today we have uh, two pilots, we have two planes. One was just outfitted with a state-of-the-art clear system. Uh, these guys, uh, help work uh, hunting, fishing, boating, trapping, uh, search and rescue, and help wildlife management with different things. So uh, they, they are a vital part, part and vital tool of what we do 
in, in the Wildlife Commission. The pilot on the left, David Desperay, lives somewhere around Morganton that way. Uh, he and I were doing some research on the aircraft history, and we found that our, we've had 23 pilots in our history. So I thought that was kind of interesting to know as well. The early administration, when, when things got started with the Wildlife Commission in 47, they really wanted to do several things with its enforcement folks. They wanted to increase our standards and, and, and get better equipment for our officers. Before 1950, there was absolutely no training. You just got hired and had to learn as you went. So during that time, the administration uh, partnered with the Institute of Government at Chapel Hill and created a 104-hour, two-week long course uh, called the Wildlife Protection School. And that was our very first school. There were 125 officers in the state at the time. They divided them into three groups. And during the spring and summer of 1950, sent them to this school where they got 104 hours of training. <coughs> the following year was our first pre-service school. Uh, the, the folks in the green uniforms, they got hired after the 50 school, but before the 51 school. And the one in the white shirts, they were for folks we refer to as the pre-service. And essentially, uh, they got selected to come to the recruit school. Uh, they were not promised a job. They weren't given a salary. They did pay their food uh, and their lodging while they were at the school. But when the school was over, they weren't promised a job. And normally, they would take the person who finished hopping the class and offer them the first opening that was open and kind of went down the list that way. Since then, we have run, uh, we'll be graduating at our 58th recruit school next week. And I would encourage you, if you've never been to one of those, you ought to come. They're, they're a special day for these folks. And, um, you know, today, our recruit school is seven months long, a lot longer than that 104-hour two-week class. Uh, so seven months long, our officers or recruits get uh, 1,200 hours of, of training, uh, classroom training, and they wear these white shirts for seven months, and 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 for that culmination in the graduation day where they get to put the full uniform on, and it's a it's a very exciting day uh, for these folks. And so again, if you haven't had a chance to come to one of those, next week we've got one, and uh, it's a special day for sure. Now Clyde Patton, again, I told you he was a passionate. He was a he was just a passionate conservation guy. Like to think outside the box. So in 1950. He wanted to send a message to the public that said, hey, we really care about our wildlife resources. And, and, and he wanted to send a message to uh, would-be poachers that, hey, we're not going to take that. And so what he did on Thanksgiving Day in 1950, all the way to 1956, he deputized every male employee of the Wildlife Commission, and they had to go out and do enforcement work on Thanksgiving Day. So I often wonder how they thought about that. I don't know, Brad, maybe you want to get you this Thanksgiving to come out. I don't know. <laughs> so that work in this thing. <laughs> All right. <laughs> One of the other things that, 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 that Patton did, uh, he, he ensured that each year we had the wildlife protectors, their phone numbers, their addresses, and uh, what counties they worked in the wildlife of North Carolina magazines. So it's kind of neat to look back through, through those. Uh, something also that, that they did to try to introduce the officers to, to the public was they had a section in the magazine that lasted nearly 25 years. It was called the Protector of the Month. It changed names just a little bit through time, but uh, it gave a lot of detail about these guys. It's kind of a short bio, but it, it, it told their birth date, their wife, their maiden name of their wife, their kid, kid's name, seriously. And there was even one that talked about how fast one of the protectors can run, so you better not try to run from it. <laughs> um, so I put a few of these in here on purpose. If any of you know Brent Ward, he was the officer and in, in, um, law officer in uh, Wake County. That's his grandfather, Lester Ward. He worked in Durham County. And then if you know Captain Kraft from District 3, his dad was also featured in 1977, Ken Kraft. He was the, the captain of District 3 uh, as well. Recently, something really nice <laughs> back in our magazine, uh, they started doing a section called On Patrol, and it's real similar. Makes me think of a protector of the month kind of thing. It's a, it's a, a little bio about the officers uh, in the field and kind of what's going on there. Fortunately, they don't put all the information about your family and all the kind of things you like to do in there, too. But it's, a, it's a neat section, and we're proud of that. Another thing that, that happened in those early days was wildlife protectors were uh, required to put up a sign outside their house. So everybody knew where the, the wildlife protector lived. Uh, and it was really for several things. I guess people would give a violation report, maybe. They would probably ask questions. But the big thing then, the wildlife protectors had to sell licenses. And I, I talked to one of the officers that went through, the son of one of the officers who went to the 1951 school, and uh, Ralph Griffin in Anson County. His, he said he could remember when he was a kid uh, opening morning of the special device season in Anson County, people lined up his daddy's driveway waiting to buy a license from him. So kind of neat. 1957 sign looked a little bit different. That's when we switched over to the diamond uh, logo for the agency. 
probably one of the biggest things that ever happened in wildlife law enforcement was our communications. Uh, in 1950, we had one plane and two cars with a radio. We had eight people called the Wildlife Patrol. They would patrol around to different places in the state and uh, use the plane and these vehicles to, to, to work on problem areas in the state. By 1956, um, all cars uh, had uh, a radio in them. Uh, 1965, we went to this base station system. We had 14 base stations across the state. <coughs> and it was, the base station was inside the wildlife protector's home. And the interesting thing was the wildlife protector's home that it was in, their wife was the dispatcher. So they dispatched the information. Of, and I, if I ask, did they get paid for it? And I've heard different stories on that. But um, around 1980 or 1974, we had a hotline that you could call. There were six numbers you could call. 1980, we went to a centralized radio system in Raleigh. And, and I tell you, as an officer in, in, in the field, and our, our dispatchers and our communication folks are amazing. They're literally a lifeline. And I was talking to Captain Jones the other day, and he told me that today, we're on track for our communication folks to answer 50,000 calls during the year on their violation line. So wow. we are so thankful for them and they do a great job. <clears throat> so not only, uh, I told you a little bit about some, or we'll talk a little bit about more about vehicles and stuff in a minute and what uh, wildlife officers had to provide themselves when they first started, but wildlife officers had to provide their own firearms uh, until around 1957 actually. And in 1954, Wall Ellis, a Mitchell County uh, wildlife protector actually was assaulted with a deadly weapon. He shot and killed the suspect. Uh, he actually ended up getting charged with murder. There were several court cases went on for several years before he was acquitted. And the attorneys at that time, defense attorneys at that time, started making a big deal out of that in our cases and started saying that, hey, the wildlife commission don't even trust their officers enough to pile their own guns. And so in 1958, um, all officers got a three or a got a 38 caliber revolver, Smith & Wesson, pre-model 10. Uh, as an issued firearm. That was the first one. Then I uh, would carry those for up until 1971 when Dewey McCall, if any of you for, uh, have ever fished Upper Creek in Burke County, uh, Dewey McCall had wrote a ticket to a man for possessing undersized trout. He made his way back to the vehicle. The man or the, the uh, suspect actually made his way back to the vehicle as well. He shot Dewey McCall in the chest, killing him. Dewey McCall actually shot back and actually hit the man in the head and it actually traveled around his skull and after that, uh, he obviously was convicted of murder, the guy was, but um, we switched over to a more powerful 357. That was the impetus uh, for that, and that was 1971. The biggest thing that probably ever changed the, the duties of a wildlife enforcement officer uh, happened in 1959, the, the passage of the voting state <coughs> in North Carolina, uh, which went effective January 1st of 1960. And it basically, that's when people had to start registering boats, carrying safety equipment. You couldn't drive uh, a, a vessel while being impaired. You couldn't reckless, recklessly operate your vessel. And so the, the legislature charged the Wildlife Commission with uh, enforcing the Boating Safety Act, or the Rules of Boating Safety Act. That has become a huge, huge part of our job. Uh, today, uh, I guess I guess probably in not 2015, uh, we started a campaign. The commission started this campaign called On the Road, On the Water, Don't Drink and Drive. And we, we reached out to partners like the State Highway Patrol, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, Forensic Test for Alcohol, to have an education and enforcement effort to uh, deter impaired operation. And I'm, I'm really proud of the fact that today, the officers of the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission are really looked at as the leaders in this. This has probably been one of the most successful impaired operation campaigns in, in the state's history. We have a team of uh, standardized field sobriety testing instructors. They actually go around, they teach DWI task force. They have actually taught at the highway patrol school. Imagine the wild guys are teaching at the highway patrol school time. You know, we're teaching troopers. And so they have become uh, known as an authority in, in this. Not only are they recognized statewide, but we are part of a national campaign called Operation Dry Water that's around July 4th every year. And um, this started in 2009. And Major Meyer can correct me if I'm wrong, but almost every single year, uh, the, the Wildlife Resource Commission wins the top agency award for that uh, national campaign. So we're recognized nationally as well. And that's, that's something to be really proud of. <clears throat> Here's a look at some of those vehicles. It was really 1956 before every officer had a vehicle. You had to provide your own. They did pay you a little bit of gas money. And surprisingly, it was 1967 before we had our first four-wheel drive vehicle, the International Scout. Then there were only about two of those. 
Uh, if you do have one, we'd love to have it for our museum. Um, so, uh, uh, 1967, before we had our first wheel drive vehicle, and actually, you would think that would kind of be standard issue for a game warden or wild protector. It was actually into the early 2000s before it was really standard issue for our guys to have it. We pulled park boats with, with Crown Vic for a long time. <laughs> Today, we have the largest fleet of boats in the state, probably the largest fleet of four-wheel drive trucks and UTVs in the state. And that has made um, the, the role of the wildlife officer um, even more um, uh, useful and, and, and needed <coughs> in our state. Obviously, you know, North Carolina is famous for, for hurricanes. <coughs> so hurricane disaster response, our folks are, are on the front lines of that. <coughs> uh, even more recently, I know up in um, District 9, uh, Commissioner Stanback, you probably, the flooding up around yeah. Crusoe and, and that area, here's some of our guys helping pull people out of that. Uh, so even also, you know, one flake of snow will shut the, shut the state down sometimes. But some of these more crippling snows, it's been wildlife officers because we have four drive vehicles patrolling the highway at night, getting people out of cars so they don't freeze to death in the car. We had officers that were uh, transporting nurses and doctors to the hospital so they could work because they didn't have four drive vehicles to get there. So become a really important part of that, important part of our job. Covert operations have been something that's been around since the beginning of law enforcement, I would assume. And there are some things in some cases you just can't work in a uniform, especially some of your larger, more egregious cases, especially commercialization of wildlife, which is such a detrimental thing to our, our resources. So covert operations have been, been around for a while, especially late 70s, early 80s. Operation Smokey was a notable one. Uh, Operation Rock was a sale of striped bass uh, down uh, toward the coast. There's been quite a few of those. Operation Rawhide was one in the early 80s that was illegal trapping in furs, but that's a big part, so much so that in 2012, uh, that we created a special operations unit here in our agency that works on some of these larger cases. And uh, we have, I think, five full-time investigators now that work in our special operations unit. Since the very beginning, education has been a primary focus of what we do for both our conservation mission and a public safety mission. Uh, you think about hunter safety a lot of times. These are some of the early hunter safety courses here on the left, but uh, our folks have instructed um, thousands of uh, instructors to teach. With hunt thousands of students have went through our, our uh, hunter safety courses, but also pre-launch boat safety checks. And obviously the media nowadays is a way we get a lot of stuff uh, out of our, our message. If you think about an officer today, Boy, I'll tell you that the world is changing so fast and technology changes even faster. And so our officers are expected to do a whole lot of stuff and change and be very flexible and continue learning different things. And, you know, so we're incorporating a lot of this modern technology that is changes so fast into the way we do our job and helping us accomplish our mission. More recently, the body worn cameras like on the body or the, the bottom right. Um, we have a drone program now. Um, so our officers are constantly having to change the technology. But one thing that I will say is that one thing that cannot change uh, is, is, is something that Teddy Roosevelt talked about in 1899. And he said this, he said, I want us game protectors. He was addressing the state of New York at the time about game wardens. And he said, I want us game protectors, men of courage, resolution, and hardihood. Obviously, if he was speaking us, to us today, he'd say, I want men and women of courage, resolution, and hardihood, and I love that word hardihood. It's something you don't hear much, and, and, you, and, and really, if you, if you start digging into it, you realize that it really means a trait of, of taking on a task that is inherently dangerous or risky, and um, that's something that, that we ask a lot of our officers. I mean, to deal with people in the middle of the night, oftentimes large groups in remote places where they can't get out on the telephone or radio, they're by themselves, and they're, you know, not every encounter is, is a nice one. Sometimes they don't like the reasons that we're there. And so uh, hardihood is something our officers have had to have. And uh, unfortunately, in our history, we've had 11 wildlife officers that have died for the cause of conservation uh, in our state. They are just in North Carolina. And three of those are not pictured there. Um, as I learn more about our history, and I love this stuff. Colonel Evans referred to that a little earlier. I love our history and I love learning about these guys. And one of the things that I have learned is I learned about the individuals is they always had that hardihood in their DNA. This middle picture is a guy who, his name's Hugh Robertson. He actually was at the Battle of Iwo Jima 
he was a Marine and he came on with us, worked around Iredale County. He taught at our school. And this is the very end of his career where uh, he's kind of showing his hardihood. He's, he's showing the recruits how to do the proper pull-ups at, at, at that retirement age. <laughs> and listen, I'm just, I'm just a little cat in, of a district. And I, I unfortunately have to sit behind a computer a lot and go to meetings a lot. And I don't get in the field as much as I would like to, but I can tell you this, that every time I do walk out in the field and work with one of my guys uh, and gals, I am so impressed at the lengths that they will go to to protect people, wildlife, and wild places. And I tell you, it just makes me so proud. And I hope it, hope it does you too. And I'm encouraged about our future because uh, these folks have that hardihood that Teddy Roosevelt uh, talked about in 1899. So there's a lot more to talk about, but that's just a just a snippet of <laughs> the wildlife uh, law enforcement story in North Carolina.